Here we are, and we'll get into our study now here in Luke chapter 19. Let's begin reading together at verse 11. I'll read to verse 27, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 11, reading to verse 27. Luke writes, uh, Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given uh, the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, you're dead. No, he didn't say that. He said to him, out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even, he, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. You know, it's interesting when the Lord Jesus Christ teaches, and you might find this interesting as you look through the Gospels and all, very often he teaches through the use of a parable. That's what we're looking at tonight here. We're looking at a parable. Parables are used in order to take heavenly truth and clothe it in earthly symbols so that people would understand things from heaven in a way that, uh, that they most clearly could understand. It's an ancient form of communicating truth and illustrating truth, these parables, and Jesus often used them. As a matter of fact, when you go through the, uh, through the Gospels, you'll see that there are at least 38 parables that are recorded in the four Gospels that we have here in our New Testament. Jesus would use stories because stories have a, a way of grabbing people's attention. When a story or an illustration is given, people have a tendency of listening more carefully. That was true during the time of Christ. It's true today. That's one of the reasons why when I teach to illustrate Scripture, very often I'll use a story because all of us have been raised with stories. Every one of us has an interest in stories. As a matter of fact, sometimes when somebody wants to tell something about their life, what they'll say is, I want to tell you my story. And that's one of the words that we use today when people say, well, I want to use my story. I want to give you my story. People understand that because we like illustrations. We like to hear things like that. And that's how Jesus teaches. I mean, there are times he gives incredible sermons. When you look at Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, that's called the Sermon on the Mountain. That's a masterful message that he gives there. But he illustrates that. He uses various things there in similes and metaphors and a variety of other ways as he teaches because it draws people's attention to what he has to say. So he uses parables quite often. It's been said that approximately one-third of his teachings were given as parables. And there were reasons why that he would use parables. He tells us in Matthew, for example, chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, why he taught so often in parables, because when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he said to them, uh, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. 
But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In other words, parables are used to reveal truth to some and to conceal truth from others. You see, when Jesus would teach, there would be great crowds. And so within that great crowd, it's really not obvious who truly believed in him and who didn't. So parables have a way of separating lazy listeners from genuine followers because genuine followers are, are going to understand and apply. They're going to hold fast to what Jesus is teaching. But a lazy listener will say, this is too hard. This is too difficult. This isn't simple enough for me. And they're going to walk away. And so those who are open to listen are going to be equipped and encouraged to follow him completely. And those who have no interest are going to walk away and continue in the way that they were prior to hearing Jesus teach. So here we have Jesus teaching. And once again, he's using a parable. And this time he's teaching something related to the coming kingdom. I want you to notice how Luke begins this because he prefaces the parable with an explanation. Notice how he says in verse 11, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable and then gives the explanation. He says, because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So he gives to you the explanation as to why Jesus is teaching this particular parable. They think that the kingdom of God is going to appear immediately. You see, there was a common belief during that time that the kingdom was going to be one of outward glory. And because of this, Jesus is showing that the kingdom's appearing is not going to occur immediately. And seeing that it is not doing so, the response should be faithful service until he does bring his kingdom. I shared with you before that during the time of Christ, there was an expectation that when Messiah came, he would immediately set up the kingdom of God. They believed that under the Messiah, Jerusalem, the city would be restored to its glory, that Israel would be regathered, that world peace would occur. And that was a general belief at that time, that the kingdom would immediately be set up. Even after this particular parable, and we're going to see this in a moment, that Jesus is speaking about a, a gap of time. Even in this particular parable, his disciples really didn't understand it because when you look in the book of Acts in chapter 1, when Jesus is ministering to his disciples, it's found in verses 4 through 6, and this takes place after his resurrection. Uh, Luke tells us, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. He said, John baptized with water, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But it says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's something that they didn't understand because they were expecting that when Messiah came, Jerusalem would once again be the center of the world, that they would be ruling, that the, those who have been dispersed throughout the world would be regathered, Messiah would be doing kingdom business. And so Jesus is giving to us, as well as to them, 2,000 years later, the understanding that the kingdom is not coming immediately. See, part of the problem, and this is something that is called in, a, in the Scriptures a mystery, and you'll see mystery. There's something like 12 mysteries spoken of in the New Testament, something like 12 mysteries. Um, there are mysteries that are revealed. What it is, the New Testament use of the word mystery isn't what we today use the word mystery to mean. In, in today's parlance, when we use the word mystery, we're, we're talking like a mystery, uh, uh, a show that's a mystery or a book that is a mystery book or something like that. It's something that's hidden from us. But the New Testament use of the word mystery is a secret that has now been revealed. It was at one time hidden, but is now revealed. And one of the mysteries that you find in Scripture is the mystery of God taking Israel and Gentiles and from the two making the one new man, which is another way of speaking of the church. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Paul said it this way. He said, In other ages this was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. The church was a mystery. The Jewish nation did not see it, didn't even know that there would be you and me, Gentiles, who would one day join in the family of God. 
The Jews did not see that during the time of Christ. They didn't realize that Jesus would gather from the Gentile nation those who would believe in him. As I've shared with you before, we have a tendency of dividing the human race into various groups. The Bible actually divides the human race in the Old Testament into two groups. In the Old Testament, you have Jew and Gentile. And that's the whole, that's all of humanity divided into two groups, Jew and Gentile. In the New Testament, humanity is divided into Jew, Gentile, and the church. The church that is composed of both Jew and Gentile who believe in Messiah. But that was a mystery. You did not see that in the Old Testament. It was alluded to. There are promises. Paul refers to those in, in the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11. He speaks concerning that there, how that God is going to do something like that. He speaks clearly in Ephesians related to that. But Jesus is here speaking about something that they, that they didn't know at that time. He is pointing out that the kingdom of God was not immediately coming, but that God had a work that he was going to continue to do, and he's continued to do that work for the last 2,000 years. And so since it had yet to be revealed, the people had an expect, expectation of an immediate kingdom, and that's what he's going to be dealing with. And that's why Luke says in verse 11 again, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem. In other words, since chapter 9, verse 51, he's been making his way to Jerusalem, and now he's about to enter into Jerusalem. He's near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And this is the reason and the background as to why Jesus gives this particular parable. And so he says in verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Obviously, this is a picture of Jesus' ascension into heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection. It also is a picture of his return to earth in what has been referred to as the second coming. And the point he's making is all of this is going to take some time. It says a certain nobleman went into a far country, that would be heaven, to receive for himself. This is Jesus in his ascension, a kingdom, and to return. Jesus is the king of glory. And then it says he's going to return. So, verse 13, he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, do business till I come. And so what he does is he calls out of his, those who are serving him ten men. And he delivers to them what are called ten minas. Now, we don't know what mina is. You know, what is a mina? And you know, some people think it's just a, a bird that you can teach to speak, a mina bird. But no, this is a mina. A mina is a Greek coin. A mina is a Greek coin that is valued at what we today would say 100 days labor. And so I was looking to see what, what a day's labor is here in the United States and all, and there really isn't a way for me to actually get that. I tried to. I looked into household incomes, tried to break it down and this and that. But it roughly would say if you're making basic wage today, a fairly good wage, I'd assume, uh, it's uh, about a, um, $200, we'll say. And so uh, that's per day. So what you're looking at is 100 days labor. And so, in other words, it's, it's a considerable sum of money. Each laborer would receive the equivalent of about three months' worth of labor. That's what he's speaking about. And so that gives you an idea about how much money this is. It would be whatever you get for three months if you've got a job, what you get for work in three months, and that'll give you an idea. It's a considerable amount of money. So I want you to notice this. Each one of his servants received the same amount and each one of his servants received the same instructions. And what he does is he gives them this money and he says, do business until I come. In other words, uh, when he says do business, carry on your duties, be diligent, work hard until I return. And so, one, we have an application right from the beginning. He's saying that the believers, those who follow after him, are going to be doing business or occupying until he returns. It's a call to action. You see it right from the very beginning. He's saying, if you have an anticipation of my return, then you ought to be working in anticipation of that. You ought to be doing something. You ought to be busy. You ought to be occupying. If I've given to you something that you steward, which is in this case his finances, if I've given to you finances to steward is the context of this, then what you're to do is you're to use that which I've given to you and occupy. Do business. Be busy. Don't be waiting. Don't be, uh, become a lazy servant who does nothing with it. You'll see that in just a moment. But you need to be somebody who is faithfully serving me until I return. As I mentioned earlier, went to the pastor's conference this last 
last week and in, in, in our National Pastors Conference, the theme of the conference is pastoring in the last days. And what we did is we took 1 Thessalonians and divided it among several speakers, several teachers over four days. And the teachers were all given an assignment and each one was to speak concerning what it's like to minister in these days that are the last days. And so, as the teachers would be speaking, that was a theme. And looking at 1 Thessalonians, we were taking it apart and sharing there were 850 national pastors in this particular conference, each one representing a church throughout the United States and internationally. We had from South America, we had Central American pastors, Japanese pastors from all over the world really gathering together for this last week. And as we gathered together and teachings were given, the theme was related to the last days. And part of what was being spoken of and what was being presented is something that all of us who come out of that particular generation of what was called the Jesus movement, all of us realized that when we first got saved, the common theme, the thing that we spoke about, the thing that we were aware of is a rela was, was related to the fact that Jesus promised to return. And how then should we live if Jesus Christ is coming back? And that was our theme. If Jesus Christ is really returning, how should I live? What kind of life should I be living? Do I really believe that? Because we can speak theology all day long. We can talk about um, dispensationalism, pre-tribulation dispensationalism. You can do that. We can speak about eschatology. We can use those terms and discuss those concepts. But the bottom line is, it's very simple. If I believe Jesus is returning, how am I living? Because if I honestly believe that Jesus Christ is coming back, it's going to affect the way that I live. If he's even at the door, if he's even about to come back, how am I living? Are there things that I had to do that ch I should change? What if I knew, for example, that Jesus Christ, for sure, if I had a bottom line knowledge and there's no way that is, I'm wrong, he's going to come back next week, would I live any differently if I knew for sure he was? And the answer is, of course, yes. 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 When I was first saved... People really, really believe that. I had friends that believed it, like unbelievably believed it. Some guys were going out with their credit cards and charging their credit cards up to leave a big bill for Antichrist. That's the truth. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. They were taking their credit card. They're still paying on it right now. <laughs> it's been 30-some years, and they're still paying on it in a minimal payment, I'm sure. There were others, friends of mine, who said, you know, they, this is true. I have a friend of mine who, uh, Herman, his name was Herman. He, um, he met a girl, her name was Linda, at a Bible study. And within three weeks, we're talking about getting married. Because the Lord's coming, we ought to get married. And, you know, together we can meet them. And, and they got married after being together maybe three or four weeks, you know. And, and I often wondered whatever happened to him and to Linda. And then years ago, I was teaching a Bible study here in this church, and Ed walked up to me after, his name was Ed Herman, I believe, walked up to me after a Bible study. He says, do you remember me? And I said, absolutely. Where's your wife? <laughs> she, she's here, you know. And it was just kind of like an amazing thing. I mean, three weeks, and they got married because Jesus is returning, and let's get married. They had kids and everything, and I promise you, they're, they're still waiting. But... There were so many people at that time who just had this incredible belief Jesus is returning, and that's because the Bible teaches that he is, and there's an anticipation of it, and there are certain things that you do. You do business. I've told you this story several times already. Some of you perhaps haven't heard it. True story. My friend George Adams, who stood up with me when I got saved, believed and believed with all of his heart that Jesus was returning, and, and he, he put that into my heart. He said, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. I mean, this is one of these guys. Jesus is coming back, David. We have to be ready. And he was one of these prayer warrior type guys. He'd carry his Bible everywhere. I mean, he'd go to the store, the supermarket, and he had his Bible in his hand. True? And, you know, if, if he climbed in my car and I backed up and he, we were talking and somebody had to get out of the driveway and I backed up, he'd say, wait a minute, let's pray before we back up, you know, and we'd, dear Jesus, take us to the curb safely. That was George. I'm not kidding. That's the way he was, you know, and, and I was just really absolutely amazed at this guy. And on one occasion, he and I were going to the store. He had his Bible in his left hand. He's sitting there in the shotgun. As I'm pulling out of the driveway, I hit the, 
I, I go forward, I hit the stop sign, take a left turn, and my passenger door did swing open, and, and George has his Bible in his left hand, and he's raising his hands like this, and he's leaning out of the car with his Bible. True story, true story. He's hanging like that with his Bible, and then I slam the brakes, and I said, where are you going, man? And this is what he said. He said, I thought the rapture happened. Jesus is a gentleman, and he opened my door. That is the truth. That's how George was. Unbelievable. He's been in a mental institution for 38 years now. No, I mean, he really believed it. I mean, this was a guy who really, really believed it. It was George who God used in my life to teach me things like being affectionate because George was one of these guys who would have to hug you every time he saw you. He had to hold your hands every time you prayed. He was a guy, if you were walking in the store with him, he'd put his arm around you and walk with you like that. I had a tough time with George for the longest time because I was not used to guys getting that close to me. And, and, but that was George. I mean, he, he just that way. He's still that way. I just got an email from him yesterday, two days ago. He's still that way. George is that way. That was where his heart was. And, and so, you know, he was the one who introduced me to the fact that the Bible teaches Jesus is going to return. And he was the one that God used in my life to affect me to actually say, if he really is returning, how then should I live? Because I meet people, I see them, you know, quite often who, who are good at prophecy. You can speak to you about Daniel's 70 weeks and they can talk to you about the nuances of Revelation and they can speak to you about Ezekiel's wheel within the wheel and all kinds of things. They can talk to you about all kinds of prophetic things who don't love people, who don't care about people, who don't live for Jesus Christ. And yet, they can talk to you about prophecy. So there has to be something about the return of Christ that motivates the way that you live. It has to change you. There has to be an anticipation, an awareness that if he's returning, then I ought to be occupying. And that's the point that Jesus is making here, you see. Your theology can be 100% accurate when it comes to, yes, Jesus is coming before the tribulation and, and all of that. And you can know quite a number of things about, about the rapture and everything. But there are certain earmarks of somebody who actually believes Jesus is going to return. And that's what Jesus is saying. Do business until I come. Be busy, be occupied, be diligent, work hard. Why? Well, we can make it very practical, and I don't want it to come off in the wrong way, but, well, because if I knew Jesus was returning for sure in a week, would I do things differently? Are there people I'd want to tell about the Lord before I go? And the answer is, yeah, of course, of course. Yes, I would live differently. I would, I would do things. Yes, I would. Would I have people in my mind that I ought to be talking to about the Lord? I'm sure that if, if I sat down for a while, I'd say, you know what? I haven't told somebody or so-and-so. That's a possibility of that. And so, you know, that's a good question. That's the point he's making. If he's going to return, are you doing business? You see, because we have a singleness of vision as believers. We actually put the Lord first in our life. And what that does is it prioritizes the rest of my life. Jesus in Luke 14, 26, we saw this uh, before. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, even his own life, well, he cannot be my disciple. It's simply saying you have to put the Lord first before everybody else. And we know as Christians that, that we let go of anything that will keep us from the Lord because in Luke 14, Jesus said, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. We know that as a disciple, if we're going to be following the Lord and being occupied until he comes, that we're going to be obedient to him because Jesus in John 14, 15 said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we also know that, that if Jesus is returning, then we're going to put away some of those things that are petty, that divide us, and we're going to begin to love people because love is a mark of a Christian. That's how people are going to know that we are believers, and that's what Jesus said in John uh, 13, 35, when he said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And so those are going to be earmarks of people who are occupying. We're going to be busy at the master's business. We're going to be doing those things that he's called us to do. And we're going to love people enough to tell them the truth and share with them when we have opportunity to and all of that. And so he says in verse 13, he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them, making them stewards, delivered to them 10 minas and said to them, 
do business till I come. These are people who receive what is not theirs, and they have responsible oversight over it. These are 10 minus. This is some money. But he's saying, the things that I'm giving to you are from me. You have a responsibility to faithfully use these things I've given to you. But, verse 14, his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So as Jesus goes to receive his kingdom, this is the picture he's given in this parable, the nation of Israel opposes his reign. And the rejection tests the loyalty and faithfulness of Jesus' servants because Jesus is this noble man. We're going to see in a moment that one of the servants obviously is influenced to reject this noble man. So the question is, in the face of rejection and even persecution, do we remain faithful to occupy? Do we remain faithful to do business for the Lord? Do we remain faithful to the task? Because holding on during times of affliction reveals genuine love for the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church, said, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. You see, the Apostle Paul was, was desiring to go and to preach in a certain area. But the Holy Spirit kept closing doors to him, not allowing him to go. And so he's wanting to go in one area, and the Spirit closes the door. He wants to go to another area, and the Spirit forbids him. But then he has a vision. The vision is the man of Macedonia. You see that in Acts chapter 16. And he simply says, come and help us. So Paul, knowing that God is calling him to a certain area, goes to this particular area. It's called Macedonia. It's in, in Greece. And as he, as he goes into that region... He becomes a minister and starts giving the Word of God in a city of Philippi. While he's there ministering in the city of Philippi, there's a sorceress. There's a woman who makes money. She's a soothsayer. She makes money for those who owned her. And she begins to follow them around. And as she follows Paul and his ministry, his mission team uh, around, she begins to speak to the people. These are the men who are giving you the way of God and all. And Paul gets greatly upset over this, that this, that this uh, woman who's, who's, who's a, uh, a soothsayer is actually speaking concerning him. And so greatly irritated, he turns and, and he casts the demon out of this woman. And it gets the people absolutely upset. The masters, those who owned her, have lost their source of revenue, and now they're greatly upset, and they take Paul, and they falsely charge him, and Paul and Silas are imprisoned in a Philippian jail as a result of that. And as they're in the jail, they are beaten severely, and they are put into the stocks. And what is interesting is that Paul refers to that when he's speaking to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and he says, you know, it was because of conflict that I first preached the gospel to you in Thessalonica. And what I find interesting about all of that is he, through great conflict, through affliction, through this beating, actually was released to go and to preach the gospel in Thessalonica. So two things. One is God had called him to Philippi with the knowledge that he was going to suffer greatly there. Paul went there and ended up suffering there. But as he went and was beaten in the way that he was, and he was severely beaten, there he is singing at midnight with Silas, praises to God, and becomes a tremendous witness to the Philippian jailer who comes and ministers to him as Paul re uh, reaches him for the gospel of Jesus Christ and leads him to Christ. And then ultimately they release him and he goes down to Thessalonica. And as he goes to Thessalonica, he says, you know, with great conflict, I first preached the gospel to you. What happened there? Well, what happened is he became an example of affliction and courage in the face of persecution. So when people receive the word of God, they also responded that way. And that's why I read 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8. He said, you received the word of God. He said, even in the midst of affliction, and you were used mildly by God in spite of that. 
So the question is, is how do we handle rejection? How do we handle persecution? How do we handle affliction? How do we handle difficult times? In the case of the Thessalonians, they held fast and trumpeted the word of God throughout the whole region. Paul said, I didn't even have to preach because you were so faithful in your preaching that people were coming to Christ as a result of that, even though you were going through hard times. And so, how we deal with hard times really is one of those ways that reveals the depth and reality of our faith. Because some people, the minute that it's difficult, man, they say, I'm out of here. Who cares? I don't want anything to do with this. this. I didn't know that being a Christian was so difficult. But the Thessalonians, in the face of persecution, had an abiding faith and endured afflictions because they trusted that the Lord would deliver them one way or another. That's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul said to them, you are waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. You're waiting for him because you know that that you're just passing through even though you go through hard times. And so servants of the Lord remain firm and fast, but some do not deal with rejection and persecution well. So believers are to do business until he returns. And we are busy sharing the things of the Lord. We're to be on the alert. We're to be watching for him and waiting for him, actively serving him. In Romans 13, 11 through 14, Paul said, Do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And so that's what happens when I have a real belief that Jesus Christ is even at the door. I live in such a way that I don't make provision for my flesh, but I pursue the Lord in holiness. Now going on into verse 15, so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So I want you to see he makes it clear that his return is sure even though it does take time. It's interesting in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, that the apostle Peter wrote, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Listen, you've been saying that Jesus is returning, and you Jesus people from the 70s and all have been saying for the longest time, well, Jesus is coming. Well, he hasn't come yet. This is exactly what the apostle Peter said is going to happen. Scoffers in the last days are going to say, well, where is he? You've been saying that for the longest time, but things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But he does return, and that's the point he's making. And ultimately what happens, notice with me, he gathers his servants together. They do that so they can give an, a, an accounting of what they did with his message. They're there to give an account of themselves, even as it says in Romans 14, 11, and 12, as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. And that's the picture that Jesus is giving to us here. There's a, a day of reckoning. They're going to give an accounting. So verse 16, then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. He said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. So notice the first two come and declare that they were faithful to the master. They faithfully worked with what the, he had given them, and there was a result. In spite of opposition, in spite of rejection of the master, they still continued to labor in his name. And so, as a result, they received rewards from their master. They were righteous stewards. And as a result of that, they hear the words that every one of us wants to hear one day, well done, good servant, and receive the reward of faithfulness. You see, in Revelation 22, verse 12, 
Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And so he's returning and he's bringing with him, you know, a reward system for those of us who have followed him. I've had people say this, and it's just, I think it just really reveals a, a sad misunderstanding of Jesus, the cost that he paid for you and for, for me, and, and just this, this is just this shallowness, I guess. If there's even a real faith there, it's so shallow. I've had people say, it doesn't really matter to me if I get into heaven smoking as long as I'm there. And I don't mean smoking ciggies. I'm sp speaking about smoking as if you pass through the fire and you come in all like wily e. Coyote or something and just like that. I've told you the story. I love this story. I don't know why I have to tell you it again. I used to work in a place that we, we, we uh, the company made drill bits for people who uh, would drill oil wells. And so what I had to do is I used to have a sandblaster and I used to sandblast tool bits and things like that, drill bits. And that's what I did. It was a very boring job and everything, but that's what I did. And, and there was a guy there who was an older fellow who was working there. I was about 19, 18 or 19 at the time, and he was an old guy in his 50s. And uh, <laughs> a real old man, could hardly get out of his own way. And... Uh, very forgetful, and as as we were there, he uh, he used to uh, he used to have there was a blast furnace that he would uh, use to treat the uh, the drill bits and everything like that, you know, to uh, to fire them and all of that. And so it, it was a huge it was a huge kind of like a, a drum, and it had a hole on the side, and he would take a long tube and he would put a match on the end of it. He would light the gas burner then slide this lighted match down the tube to ignite the pilot light, and then the furnace would come on and it would cure the, uh, the pieces that he would put in this particular furnace. And one day, he turned the gas on and stood there talking. And he just kept talking and talking, and you know where I'm going with this, talking and talking and talking. And now, I was about 10 yards from him, maybe, and I had my arms folded, and we were kind of just talking. He lights the match, slides it down that, that opening, and the gas ignites and blew this huge door right off the hinges, blew it right out, and all the fire escaped out of the sides. And he's standing like this when he did it, and it just, boom, it sounded like a, a, just a bomb went off. And it was like a starter pistol to me, to be honest with you. I was gone. I mean, boom, gone. You know, I was, the rapture happened, and I was out of the building, you know. I do remember, I mean, I truly was. I mean, I was gone. The thing that, bang, I was out. Then I came walking back. He was still standing there. He hadn't moved with his hand like this, smoking. I mean, his hair, everything, he had, his clothes, there are people who are going to get into heaven like that, and they're okay with that. No, I'm not. I'm not like that. You know, I don't want to enter in smoking like that. But so I've had people say, well, as long as I get in, that's not how I want to go into heaven. That's not how I want to make my entrance in all of that. You know, I, I know that the Lord gives rewards, and I know there are proper rewards for service done unto him. And, and if he says, my reward is with me and I am coming quickly, that is supposed to encourage us, even though this message was given 2,000 years ago, that is to encourage us to occupy until he comes. That, that's what the church is supposed to do. And one of the problems that I see today, unfortunately, in the church is because we're so me-centered and entertainment-centered and I want amusement, I want you to occupy me with something that makes me laugh or at least draws me back. The whole problem is, is we have lost the ability to be sober-minded in the biblical sense and to say, look, at, we don't have that much time. Let's do something with what we have. There's so many who don't have that in their mind that they're just not busy doing the things that the Lord would call us to. One of the guys was mentioning that people go to church for amusement. He said, and the sad thing about that is he says, do you know what the word amusement means? And, and so he broke it down for us. And all of us, if we think about it for a minute, we can figure out what it means because amusement simply means somebody who doesn't think deep. Why? Well, because the word muse means to meditate or to think upon something. You muse over certain things. When you put the word a as a prefix before the word muse, a is a Greek meaning that it takes it away, meaning you do not muse, you do not think. And so amusement is putting you in a place where you don't think. 
And so what we want is to be entertained so that we don't think. And if we don't think that way, then, then if we don't agree with that, all we have to do is ask ourselves, is that true? Well, for me, I have to say there are times that that's absolutely true. How do I know that? Because I plop myself down in front of the TV set and I don't want to think. I just sit there watching the game. I don't care if the Lakers won. I don't care if they lost. I don't even know because I fall asleep. I mean, that's what Super Bowl is for me. It's a great nap, you know. <laughs> amusement. It just, I'm vegging. We call it vegging. Well, that's what amusement is. And here's the problem, guys. It's when we carry that mentality into our spiritual life. It's when we bring that into our churches. It's when we come in and sit down and say, I'm not going to stay here if you don't amuse me. There's your problem. And that's what's happening today. And that's why a lot of churches have a lot of bodies, but they don't have a lot of believers. Because people show up, but when it gets hard and when affliction happens, when persecution hits, they never share their faith. And when they try to and they're shot down, they say, who needs this? And they just move on down the line. And what happens is they don't really believe the Lord is returning. But if I do and if you do, well, we're going to be busy at the, at the master's business. That's what Jesus is talking about, you see. Two of these guys believed it. So they said, we're busy. You know, I took what you gave to me, multiplied it, and this is yours. I was a steward. I gave it. I did it. This other guy says, I took it, multiplied it. This is yours. And that's the one who gets the well done. But there's a third one. Verse 20, another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. <laughs> I, I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? Well, notice this. He's basically saying this. I did nothing with your message. I lived and I let live, not willing to have any problems in life. I didn't want to stir up opposition. I didn't like being uncomfortable. I didn't want to appear to be intolerant. I didn't want to openly side with you. And to be honest, I acted out of fear, and I was simply unfaithful. Yes, I realized that you were the one who was giving to me a stewardship responsibility, but I never took it seriously. It's kind of like some of us have experienced this. I, 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 would, I would probably think all of us have experienced this, where you've gone to a store where there's a clerk who is busy on the phone and not wanting to talk to you, and you stand there, and you wait for them to look at you, and they'll go, just a minute, oh, yeah, he's so cute or whatever, you know. And you're standing there thinking, and I've done this on several occasions. I, I don't say anything to the clerk. You know, I, I'm generally pretty patient with them. As a matter of fact, I'm always patient with them. I don't want to say something mean to them. I just speak about them in church. <laughs> <laughs> All of us know this, though. This is a common thing. <laughs> Gossip. But I've turned to Marie and I've said, obviously, they don't own this business. They own this business they'd be making sure their customers are cared for. It's obvious they don't own this business. They're working for somebody else, maybe minimum wage, and maybe they don't care about this, and maybe they'd like a different job. I don't know, but they obviously don't like what they're doing because the best employees are the ones who like their job, the ones who are most responsible, the ones who understand you know, that that's the best employee, the ones who want that business to survive and to actually excel. Well, that's the person you want to have working for you, but the person who doesn't care, the person who stays on the phone and all of that, well, that's how this person is. Yes, you gave to me three months' worth of wages, and you told me to occupy till you come, but what I did is I put it in a handkerchief, and I buried it, and there's a good reason, and I want you to see the reason that he gives to him. Verse 21, I feared you because you're an austere. That word austere means you're harsh. You are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. I feared you. I feared you. Now, on the one hand, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's a certain sense of fear that every believer has of the Lord. 
because he's majestic and powerful because he is awesome God. And naturally, we are creatures and he's the creator. And, and in that relationship, there's going to be a reverence, a fear towards God that, that really earmarks a believer because those who don't have a fear of the Lord don't know God. But that's not what he's saying. It's like, as a little boy, I had a fear of my father. You know, if, if my dad said, do something and, and I didn't do it, then I knew that I was going to receive, you know, recompense for that. I was going to get disciplined. If I smarted off to my dad, I, I, I really didn't do that. As bad as I became in my later teen years, I was not disrespectful to my father at that time. If my dad, I remember on one occasion, my dad said something to me and, and I said, yeah. And to my dad, the word yeah was a disrespectful word. So I said, yeah. He said, David, blah, 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 yeah. And he, I remember to this day, my dad said to me, what did you say? Because I was taught to say yes or yes, sir, to my father. You don't say yeah, because that's disrespectful. That's how it's done. And I'm still that way with my older members of this church. You know, it's yes, sir, because I was trained to do that. It was just a polite thing to do. It's a right thing to do. It shows respect for people, and I was taught to do that. I still do that. If Pastor Chuck speaks to me, I say, yes, sir, because he's like a father to me. So I'll say, yes, sir, to him. That's the way it ought to be. But I'll tell you something. You can say that you can have that fear of a father, or you can have a fear of a stranger, and when you have a fear of a stranger, it's not the same as the fear of a father. If you walk in as a little, little kid and you walk into the room and you see a big figure in that room, you get afraid because you don't know who it is. If it's your dad, you instantly can be, oh, it's daddy. It's okay. You know, I'm not afraid. But if it's a stranger, there's a different kind of fear. And this, when he says, you're an austere man and I feared you, he's speaking about you're a stranger to me. This is a way of saying, I don't have a relationship with you. It's not the fear that brings you to service to God at all. It's a misunderstanding of who God is. And that's why the Lord is going to deal with him. I saw you, notice verse 21, I saw you as harsh. I saw you as demanding. I saw you as wanting things from me that really don't belong to you. Well, in Deuteronomy 10, verse 14, the Bible makes it clear that God owns all things. He says, indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God also the earth with all that is in it. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. He's saying that you reap what you did not sow, you collect what you did not deposit. That tells me he doesn't know the Lord because God owns all things. And so we see him as seeing him as God is as harsh. He doesn't see him as the loving Savior that he is. And so the result, verse 22, he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you. You wicked servant, you knew that I was an austere man collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Well, why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? So if you really believed that I was a harsh judge, that should have provoked you to service because if that kind of belief was real, it would have provoked you to serve me. A genuine, though uninformed, faith would have produced obvious works. His lack of action reveals a real lack of faith. And that's why God calls him a wicked servant, and that's why God brings judgment to him. Now, when it says in verse 24, he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. They said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Well, God has given to us the ability to trust and believe in him. Every child has this ability from the time they're born. I've seen that to be true in my children's life. I see that to be true in my grandchildren. Son Josiah, I will see that eventually to be true with Sophia as she's growing older. You see, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says that God has put eternity in their hearts. There is a sense that there's something greater than us that is natural. 
to humanity. It's natural. When's the last time you ever saw turtles conducting a funeral? Or frogs, you know, with the frog preacher? He's talking at a funeral where one of the frogs croaked. <laughs> uh, sorry. That was good. I like that one. But you, don't, you don't have that. Why not? Because they don't have a sense of eternity because they're animals. They do not have a spirit. They do not have a soul. They die and they go into the ground. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, but when a human being dies, his spirit goes to the God who gave it. We have a different mentality. We conduct funerals. The funerals are never for the dead. They're always for the living because we have to mourn the loss of the one we loved. And we speak concerning the reality of a life well spent and an eternity before God when they're Christian. We have funerals because within us, there is a sense of eternity. We have religious ceremonies overwhelmingly because of that. And so God has given to you an ability to believe. But what happens? Here's your, here's your point that Jesus is making here, I believe, when he says in verse 26, to everyone who has will be given. From him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. What happens when you don't fan the flame and feed the faith that a child has? He becomes dull to it and eventually turns away from anything. And that's where you get people who are irreligious, unreligious, atheists, agnostics, because they had the capacity, because eternity being in their hearts, had the capacity to believe in something greater than themselves, but they can become hardened to it. If you don't fan the flame, if you don't feed it, feed that faith, it becomes hard and gone. Here's something that none of you probably know. When I was eight years old until I was 14, I played the trumpet. Oh, yep, that's true. The trumpet. Why, I do not know, but I did. I played in bands, you know, school bands and things like that for years. And uh, you handed me a trumpet now, I can't even make a sound in it. I can't make a sound, you know. I can't play it. I still remember the scale. I know those things. I can still read music. I did it for years. But I can't play that because it requires practice. It re required practice every day and sometimes for hours. You know, that's how you become good at anything. And if you don't practice, you will lose it. Everybody knows that. If you don't practice. Some of you were athletes. You could go out to the ball field, throw a glove on. You didn't even really have to warm up that much. You were ready to play. But for me, I played ball for years. I played baseball every day. And I played it every day for hours. And I played it six, uh, uh, six days a week, at least six days a week. When Marie met me, I was on three softball teams, two fast pitch and a slow pitch. I played a lot of baseball. I enjoyed it. That's what I did. I used to run every day. I did all kinds of things all the time. You know, my kid, one of my kids, Anna, saw me run the other day. I was running, I was playing, and I ran. She said, I have never in your life ever seen you run a stepdad. And the funny thing is, is she doesn't know that I was an athlete, that I was on the track team in high school. She doesn't know any of that because I never talk about that. Those are things that are just the past. I mean, come on, that was 40 years ago, you know, right? I can't do any of that anymore. I can't do any of that because I don't practice any of that. And I'm older, obviously, but I don't, I don't do any of that. If you, if you don't practice, you do lose the ability. There's no doubt about it. In matters of faith, if your faith isn't fanned, if it's not fed by God's word, then the little that you had is gone. Because there at one time was the ability to add to that. Like a little mustard seed, it could have grown. But instead of adding to it, this guy said you are austere, you reap what you didn't sow, you, you're just a harsh individual. I, and, and what he's really revealing is, I, I didn't believe in you. I was affected by 
the rebellious ones who rejected you and didn't want you to rule over them. And though I know you gave me the same thing that you gave everybody else and you gave to me the same orders, it was so inconsequential to me that I just buried it and didn't even use it. He says, is that right? Well, you take what he had and you give it to the one who's been very loyal and very faithful. And they're blown away at the extravagant grace. They say, he already has 10. How extravagant, extravagantly graceful God is. He says, you take that because he didn't put that into practice. It's no longer to be part of his life at all because you are going to go into judgment because you don't have a relationship with me. And that's what he's saying in verse 27. Bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them. Slay them before me. It's a picture of final judgment by the king. The faithful are welcomed in. Those who rejected his rule are judged. And so the moral of this particular parable, Jesus' servants are loyal and faithful until the end producing what God has given to them, using what God has given to them in such a way that they will hear his words, the words that all of us want to hear when he says, you've been a good servant, well done. That's the whole point. The Pharisees and the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah, but within that nation, there were those who accepted him. They are the ones who are going to be blessed by him.